invite you to Genesis chapter 37 to 50 today. A good big chunk that we're going to deal with. Obviously not verse by verse, because otherwise we'd be here till probably next week. But uh, Genesis 37 to 50, and considering how God in His mercy and grace transforms evil uh, to good. Just as we sang about just a moment ago, you're always good. And I wonder if sometimes Joseph, as we'll be dealing with today, was wondering if God was good. Uh, when he was stuck in a pit or when he was uh, in prison. So we'll be dealing with that today. Let's begin our time in prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the life of Joseph, that we can see someone go through such great trials and know that it was for good that you do work all things for our good. We who are called according to your purpose, we who love you. Lord, I pray that we would see the parallels between Joseph's life and ours. That we could come away this week, and even in the darkest times that we have this week, we could say that you are good. And whatever evil would befall us this week, we could see how you're transforming it into good. Lord, help us to see your mercy and grace in our lives this week. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You know, there's an old saying, that opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. Supposedly, uh, the inventor of the light bulb said this, but it's been attributed to several other people ahead of that. And in a similar fashion, the mercy and grace of God is often missed because it's dressed in trials and looks like hardship. It requires the eyes of faith to see that such things are turned by God into our good. Often we miss it because it looks horrible. It looks painful. And we often don't see the good that comes out of what often is meant for evil for us. The life of Joseph, if you're somewhat familiar with it, if, if you've been to Sunday school growing up, whatever, you know Joseph, the, the, the favorite son, ends up being betrayed by his brothers. And the amazing thing at the end is his statement, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so we're going to see today through chapters 37 through 50, uh, the book of Genesis, that God, in His mercy and grace, or even just we could say by His character of being merciful and gracious, is transforming evil to good. Really, this is a foundational aspect of who God is, His sovereignty, even as we saw last week with Job, that God was in control of Job's suffering. He was the one permitting it. And so... Uh, so is the case here in the life of Joseph. I point us first to begin with considering how the eyes of faith are really required to see God's mercy and grace when we face the trial of betrayal. In Genesis chapter 37, as we pick up here in verse 18, the brothers of Joseph, they saw him, Joseph, from afar. And before he even came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. Too often we uphold, even if we don't say it in our minds, we uphold uh, the families of old, the families in the Pentateuch, as being these wonderful people, and they were pretty what well, old rascals. Here's Joseph's own brothers, many of them his half-brothers, the, the brothers by his father, but by his mother's sister. 
And they're there. And as soon as they see Joseph, their first thought is, let's kill him. This is betrayal. Notice he comes and they said to one another, here comes this dreamer, they're deriding him. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. They're jealous of him because God has given him some dreams about how they will bow down to him, even his father. By the time we get to the end of the story, we will find that they do bow down to him. But because of their jealousy of him, because of their hatred to him, because of what God has shown, they want to kill him. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother later in the chapter? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. I don't know if it's worse to be killed or to be sold off. Here, Judah, wanting to make a profit and possibly even trying to find a way to save uh, Joseph from his brothers, Reuben had this thought as well, according to the text. Judah says, why should we kill him? There's no profit in it. We can't make any money from this. Why should we have to conceal his blood when it's just easier to sell him off? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, these traders that were going down to Egypt. Let us not our, let, us, and let not our hand be upon him. Why? Because he is our brother, our own flesh, and his brothers listen to Judah. The Mennonite traders, those with this Ishmaelite caravan, passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Even Jesus fetched a higher price than Joseph. Here, Joseph coming at the order of his father to check on his brothers who are keeping the flock, comes, and as soon as they see him a long way off, probably very distinctive with his coat of many colors, their, their plan is murder. And only by, by the promise, the, the thought of money, do they change their plan. If you need, have family like this, who needs enemies? And what could have gone through Joseph's head as he's being betrayed by his own brothers? Many of us at times will face betrayal by even those closest to us. And when we're in the middle of that, it's hard to see beyond the current situation. It's hard to see that God's grace and mercy are working right in that situation. It takes eyes of faith that is trust in God to see that His good, grace and mercy are at work even when we face betrayal. That this, as Romans says, is for our good. The eyes of faith are required to see God's mercy and grace when we face the trial of betrayal, especially when it's those closest to us. Likewise, the eyes of faith are required to see God's mercy and grace when we face the trial of false accusation. In our day, many have fallen to false accusation. Some have not fallen to true accusation, sadly. But just in, in recent times, how many different uh, appointees to the justice system ha have been removed from consideration based on false accusation? Here in Genesis chapter 39, we have Joseph working, after being sold into slavery, working so well for his master, putting all his efforts into it for his master that he's now the steward of the household. He's the manager. His master, Potiphar, has no idea even how much he owns anymore. And yet, Potiphar's wife, accuses falsely Joseph. Here, one day, when he, when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house were there in the house, but Potiphar's wife, she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled 
out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. If I was one of these men, I think I want to know, well, I didn't hear you. Did you cry really that loud? But of course, that's not how the narrative goes. That's not how God shapes Joseph's life. Here is a woman who is trying to to ensnare Joseph, and when she might get caught, she blames Joseph for the very thing she was trying to do. In fact, as soon as Potiphar heard what happened, in fact, here she says, as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. She laid the garment by her until his master came home. And she told him, she told Potiphar the same, I like the word here, story, because it's a fiction. She told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. And as soon as his master heard these words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. Imagine being Joseph. I can understand from Potiphar's perspective, all he knows is what his wife tells him. Maybe Joseph is protesting, we don't know. It doesn't say that Joseph even spoke up for himself. Probably he wasn't even his place. As the slave, he has no rights. But could you imagine Joseph being Joseph's sandals for a moment? If you're like me, you'd probably be over there grumbling and talking on your breath, I don't deserve this. He should really know what kind of woman his wife is. I'll get even one day. I'll show them. I don't deserve this. And yet, the story continues, and we even see that as he is falsely accused and placed in prison, Joseph begins to see some of the good that God has in store for him. How God is transforming this for Joseph's good. Where is Joseph being put in prison? He isn't just sold off. Most masters would even just sell you off or kill you. But Potiphar being the keeper of the prison, the, the, the captain of the guard for Pharaoh basically, puts Joseph in prison with the rest of the king's prisoners. But only by false accusation. And when that happens in our lives, when that trial comes, it's hard for us sometimes to see it takes trust in God that even this false accusation is for good. That your mercy and grace are actively involved in the situation. That even false accusation, the trial of it, is for our good. It takes trust in God to see that. And sadly, most of our reactions is, I'll just suck my thumb and open a can of worms and have a pity party. Because it's devastating. Because it hurts so much. So it takes the eyes of faith to see God's mercy and grace when we face the trial of false accusations. And it takes eyes of faith to see God's mercy and grace when we face the hardship of being forgotten. Some people are fine being alone. For, but for many people, being forgotten is one of the worst betrayals you can face. And here's Joseph in chapter 40, after helping out two of the king's servants. And the text tells us, until something comes up, Joseph is forgotten. 
sometimes when people forget us, it's, it's hard to see that this sometimes is for our good. That God's mercy and grace are still active in our lives, that God is still working even when we get forgotten. Notice here that one night, here is the cupbearer and the baker of Pharaoh. They both dreamed, and the cupbearer and the baker of the king, who were confined in prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. And when Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. Something we should note here is at this point, Joseph is basically running the prison from within the prison. If you want a modern day comparison, Joseph is Hogan from Hogan's Heroes. He's running the whole prison by himself from within. And here he is and he comes by in the morning and he sees that the cupbearer and the baker are both troubled. They've had a dream, but they don't understand it. They don't know what it means. Joseph has seen some good. He, he's, he's gotten promoted within prison, if that's possible. But he sees these two men, and he helps them. So he asks Pharaoh's officers, the the cupbearer and the baker, who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. I think if I were in Joseph's sandals, I'd be like, good luck with that. I'll see you tomorrow. I've got enough problems of my own. I'm in prison here like you guys. Yet he says, don't the interpretations belong to God? Isn't God involved in this? Of course, Joseph gives him the interpretation And on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the baker among, chief baker among his servants, and restored the chief cupbearer to his position and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. They hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. And what's the end? Yet the chief cupbearer, what? did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Don't you remember when I did that thing for you, Chief Cup, Chief Cup? Don't you remember? Just three days ago, I told you you'd be restored, you'd be back, you'd have a good life again. Of course, it wasn't great news for the baker. He gets killed, he gets hanged. But Chief Cupper, couldn't you remember just for three days? What happens when you're forgotten? Do you see it as good? Or does it seem like no one cares? Well, it takes eyes that trust God to see that God's mercy and grace are involved when we face the hardship of being forgotten. When others forget us, God has not. And it takes eyes of faith to see this. To understand that even if we're walking through an experience like Joseph is here, that God is still in control and this is being worked out for my good. Lastly, the eyes of faith are required to see God's mercy and grace when we face the hardship of forgiving those who have hurt us. Human beings, by nature, we want revenge. We want to get back at all those who have hurt us. It's natural, it's built into us in our sin nature, and so it takes eyes of faith to forgive. Chapter 42, as we get towards the end of the story, Chapter 42, Joseph, the cupbearer, finally remembered him. He interprets Pharaoh's dreams, and now Joseph was governor over the land. We could think of Joseph here 
really as prime minister. The only one higher than Joseph is Pharaoh. He's got some pull now. I could imagine Potiphar just being a little bit uh, shaky there when he finds out Joseph is the new boss. Weren't you my slave? That might be a problem, right? But Joseph is governor over the land. In fact, he's the one who sold to all the people of the land the, the grain that they stored up because of the, the great years, the fat years, and then now he's selling it during the lean years, and Joseph has been appointed to administer all this. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him. That promise God gave him a long time ago. Joseph, your brothers are going to come bow down to you. Well, now it's happening. And they bowed their faces to the ground. And Joseph saw his brothers and he recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Wouldn't this be the time to get your revenge, Joseph? To go, aha, I've got you now. Yet they didn't recognize him. Joseph probably dressed in Egyptian style, probably had a very Egyptian uh, outlook. And then after, as the story progresses and they get grain and they realize who Joseph is in chapter 50, now Isaac dies. They've all moved to the land of Goshen inside the borders of Pharaoh's domain of Egypt. And just imagine the brothers. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead. And here's what they think. It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. The chicken, as some have said, has come home to roost, right? Uh-oh, dad's gone. Probably Joseph wasn't being mean to us because dad was still around. Now dad's gone. What's going to happen? And so they send a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. They're lying out their teeth, by the way. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father. None of these men have lived like they belong to the God of their father. Judah has a child by his daughter-in-law. All the sons have committed murder. And yet they're trying to appeal to Joseph. Don't hurt us, Joseph. And notice what happens to Joseph. Most of us would be over there rubbing our hands going, yeah, it's time. I'm going to get my revenge now. But look at what the eyes of faith bring us to. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. It broke his heart that he, they would even think that now he's going to get revenge. In fact, his brothers come. They fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. They're trying to, to, to get on his good side. We'll, we'll serve you, Joseph. Joseph said to them, Do not fear. For am I in the place of God? Am I really in the place of God? Am I supposed to be running things here? As for you, Joseph tells them straight, you meant it for evil. You meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. Only God, by His mercy and grace, can transform what other people design as evil for us and turn it into good. Only the almighty, powerful God can take this world's evil and make it praise Him. And here in Joseph's life, here he is and he says, you meant it for evil, 
All the things I went through, I, I can only imagine that the brothers had heard all of the, about Joseph's experiences. I kind of wonder if Potiphar came over one day and said, Je- be careful, boys. He was my slave and I unjustly threw him in prison. I'm still waiting for him to fire me. Imagine the cupbearer coming by. You know, I forgot Joseph and he rotted in prison for years more. And he was only in prison because Potiphar threw him there and he was only Potiphar's slave because you guys sold him. Joseph, instead of revenge, says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for, for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. How hard is it to comfort someone and speak kindly to them when they've wronged us? I know that's not my first reaction. And yet it takes eyes that trust God to see that even though they were acting evil against you, that God has designed it for good. That this is a good thing, and He forgives them. It really does take trust in God to forgive those who have wronged us, who have hurt us. Now, I don't think Joseph ever really went out and uh, went out into the field with them again near a pit. Pretty sure he was a little wary of them but he forgave them. And boy, does that take faith. Peter asked Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? And this is small spats. Seven times seven, isn't that great, Jesus? Well, 70 times seven there, Peter. And you can just kind of see Peter's head sag going, this is impossible. You don't know my brother, he's ordinary. Jesus, how could you, not 70 times seven? takes eyes of faith to see God's mercy and grace at work when we face the hardship of forgiving someone that's hurt us. So what's our response? When we're hurt, when we're forgotten, when we're falsely accused, when we're even betrayed, often we, in our natural, our sinful person, we we turn and we start to bite like an animal caught in a trap. It really takes trust in God to go, no, I can respond differently. I don't have to fight for myself here. So what is your response? When you're hurt, when you're betrayed, when you're forgotten, when you're falsely accused, Is it to trust God, or is it to turn and bite? We should ask ourselves if we can see God when He's turned the evil of others into good. When things even seem to be going against us after we get through it, because oftentimes we can't see beyond the own, our own immediate problems. But can you look back? Can you see in your life when things have looked so desperate, when others have hurt you, that then God has turned that around from evil that was meant for you into something good? Even maybe it's just through the the forgiveness process has God turned the evil of others into good. Can you see it? Really, it does come down to faith. Is your God big enough to be trusted when others injure you? Or is he so small that it's up to you to get revenge? Is he so small that you have to fight? Is your God big enough to be trusted? can be trusted even when the hurt comes and is personal. 
God big enough? And if he's not, if you can't trust him, then I ask you, who are you really trusting in? Is it the God of the Bible who can make everything, who can destroy everything, who has provided redemption? Or is it a God of your own making? Because the God of the Bible can be trusted. He is big enough. Joseph trusted him. Now, I don't think all of us will become the prime minister of Egypt or even president here, hopefully not. But even when the hurt comes, when the struggles, when the trials, when the accusations, when the hardships come, is God big enough to be trusted? Trials and hardships often cause us to overlook the mercy and grace of God, to miss it, because our eyes have not been trained to be eyes of faith, to see God turning such hardships and trials into our good. The mercy and grace of God is often missed because it's dressed in trials and looks like hardship. And it takes the eyes of faith for us to see that God is turning it from evil to good. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We thank you for the example of Joseph. Lord, his life was often hard and unpleasant. We could hardly imagine being a slave, let alone then being thrown in prison. Yet through it all, we see him trusting you. Lord, we see often over and over again him working whatever position you've placed him in to, to glorify you. And that when he forgave his brothers, it wasn't just a thought on the spot, but he had been trusting you the whole time. Lord, help us to have the same trust. Lord, help us to see how wonderful you are, how great and grand and almighty that you are. So we can trust you even when we face such hardship and trials, especially when we're hurt by those closest to us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.